Hello, and welcome to the Gravel Ride Podcast, where we go deep on the sport of gravel cycling through in-depth interviews with product designers, event organizers, and athletes who are pioneering the sport. I'm your host, Craig Dalton, a lifelong cyclist who discovered gravel cycling back in 2016 and made all the mistakes you don't need to make. I approach each episode as a beginner to unlock all the knowledge you need to become a great gravel cyclist. This week on the show, I welcome Matt Lieto from Bend, Oregon onto the show. Matt's a former triathlete. We'll get into that a little bit. And a gravel racer. Been doing it out of Bend for a number of years. Has been involved in organizing some of the great events up there in Oregon. But more importantly for today's show, Matt's been involved with Protect Our Winters, a nonprofit organization founded by snowboarder Jeremy Jones back in 2007 with the basic premise that he was seeing the world that he calls home out there in the big mountains getting destroyed by climate change. He he wasn't seeing the same kind of snowpack. He was observing change and decided to make some change. He decided that athletes, outdoor enthusiasts of all kinds, we have a voice in the political process. And he set about to create an organization to help passionate outdoor people protect the places and lifestyle they love from climate change. We're sitting here in the first week in November. Next week's the midterm elections. There's still time to get out there and vote, do your civic duty. I'm a little bit on a soapbox with Matt during this conversation, but I think it's important. Head on over to protectyourwinters.org. You can find out everything you need to know about the voting process in your local community. There's still time in many states to get registered and absolutely there's time to prepare your ballot and get it submitted for the midterm elections. With that said, let's jump right into my conversation with Matt. Hey, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Appreciate you having me. Excited. Yeah, I am looking forward to getting into gravel, your background, but I'm most excited to talk about POW, and we'll get into that later. Yeah, it's it's okay if you you prioritize the climate and the world in, in, in front of getting to know me. That's fine. I'll let it go. Wow. Very <laughs> modest ego. I like it. So Matt, we always start out just by getting a little bit of background about you, how you got into the sport and how you got into gravel. We yeah. got to talk a little bit about your, your, your skinny bike background and that arrow position you used to have, but not too much. I don't want to scare the listeners off. Can't ignore it. I know there's a, you know, no matter what the, the triathletes do and the time trialists do, they're always going to have... <sighs> They're going to have their, their work cut out for them for sure. But the reason I've like always got along with mountain bikers, cyclists, and why I'm one myself is I don't mind making fun of myself. Self-deprecation. It's my, my biggest strength slash weakness. So let's go for it. It's important. It's important that the regular listener will know that I have admitted to my Ironman triathlon past. I don't wear it like a badge, but I'm not afraid to say that I did that. So you literally like, you don't have a tattoo or anything. No. No, I okay, would, good. if I could aim the camera down there, I'd show you my calf. There's no <laughs> don't big move your, eye don't, down there. I don't want to see you move your camera south, man. Keep it up. <laughs> so I how did you, chest. you're up in, you're up in Bend these days. Is yeah. that where you kind of found the bike and found triathlon originally? No, actually I started doing try when I lived in Northern California. So like 98 maybe. And kind of the cheesy story is my brother actually was a, a great professional triathlete was second at Kona and another world championship a couple of times. And I watched him race a race in Hawaii. And I, at the time I was like 260 pounds and I was like, wow, these guys are having more fun than me and lost a bunch of weight, went home and started training for triathlon, trying to get it across the finish line on one of those things. And it turned out I was decent at it and was training with my brother, had a good guide and, you know, just kind of kept plugging away, became a professional triathlete after maybe three years of that. And yeah, kind of just enjoyed that experience. And I, I was telling you off air, like the, if I would have started younger and if I had the better pain tolerance, I probably would have tried to be a cyclist because that was kind of my, my strength and what I love doing. But turns out I'm kind of mediocre at three sports. So triathlon worked for me. <laughs> nice. What distances were you running and racing in triathlon? I did. I've done them all. Like I did the... Okay. Olympic distance, did Xterra because again, I, I just enjoy riding all kinds of kinds of bikes. So I went to national world champs a couple times for Xterra. I uh, did half Ironman it was probably my strength in triathlon, just because you could like as a cyclist, you could Ironman at least then or for me it was about what watts can you hold for the whole thing and not crack. Where the half distance is, oh, I'm faster than you and I'm gonna 
try to rip your legs off like that to me was fun because i just love riding a bike hard and then uh, yeah that's pretty much it did duathlon was duathlon national champion once way back in the day and yeah just kind of kind of did it all but through all that i did road racing crits raced a bunch of pro like nrc stage races and all that good stuff so gotcha gotcha and was finding kind of gravel just a natural thing up there in bend <laughs> yeah i mean it's you know we we've got winter here or we had winter and we'll get you know this great segue into what we'll talk about here eventually but you know so cinders on the roads you know instead of salt to to keep the roads clear here we have cinders so those could be a little bit sketchy if you're riding a road bike so originally when i moved to town i was working at a bike shop wrenching and stuff and bought a cross bike for that and then once i had my cross bike i was like and i have good buddies with like carl decker and Ryan boat and those guys and every ride we just ended up on dirt every you know whether it be single track or whatever and after a while like and there, those guys are all capable of anything, right? So we'd be on a ride and I'd be on my TT bike and we'd end up on single track. And I'm like, guys, this is like not that awesome on my time trail bike. <laughs> so eventually I got the right right bike for the job. And yeah, and in Bend, it's just there's so many dirt and gravel roads, certainly in the winter to be able to, to ride when a lot of the pavement isn't clear and you're going slower. So it's less, you're less cold. You know, it's 35 degrees outside going 20 on a road bike doesn't sound that fun, but going... 12 on a gravel bike is pretty sweet. So yeah, that's kind of, and when did you start to see like the gravel bike events take off and capture your attention? Well, yeah, in Oregon we had, we had like kind of a, we had a rad, I think a really cool like road racing scene or we used to. And a guy I actually ended up working with now Chad Sperry helped him put on the Oregon trail gravel grinder. He'd been putting on road races for years and there was a road race, man, I want to say it he must have started in 05, but it was uh, Gorge Roubaix, called it. And we had like six miles of gravel on every lap. That was like a 20 mile lap. And it was a Cat 1, like proper full on road race. And I think one year, like Ned Overend was out there with us and like all sorts of like fast dudes. And so we were riding 23C road tires on gravel you know, in 08 or 09. And then we slowly started, like after that race, he put on a race. He's like, why don't we just do a race that's totally on gravel? And I think maybe he started that in, in 12. And then obviously with everybody else kind of catching up, it was kind of, kind of natural, but it was, it was fun. It was almost weird going to races where we're riding like 30 plus C like cross yeah. tires for gravel. Cause we're so used to like picking through everything on 25s, but I think my first, in fact, I know my first gravel event was one of those events outside of Bend, maybe in Sisters. And I went okay. up there, I had like a first gen Niner gravel bike, maybe 32s okay. on it. But my buddy that came with me only had a road bike and we yeah. kind of read and they're like, you can do it on a road bike. So he was out on a road bike on that. He did get the shit beat out of him, I will say, <laughs> and all the stutter bumps, but he, he managed to survive it. Yeah. Was that the, the, was that the gorge or was it at in bend like near bend? It was near bend. Okay. Yeah. I mean, dude, yeah. Uh, more power, more power to him for sure. And all this being said, like when we were doing this stuff, you know, there was one year when we went from going from like the race with just the eight mile segment to like the full race. I mean, there must've been 25 guys that flatted in the race. Like I've flatted, 20 miles in and like the support vehicles like do we're well out of tubes man like you're on your own so <laughs> there's definitely like growing pains with how we tried to do it but it's, it's pretty fun pretty fun yeah it's so interesting i mean we talk about it a lot here just how the equipment has evolved to just make the disasters less frequent right like i just i had a cross bike back in the day and every time i rode it hard off road on mount tam i would flat and i was just like why am i bothering doing this i might as well just ride a mountain bike and not flat yeah, totally. It's, yeah, it's crazy. I think people forget at times what the technology has allowed for us. Like right now I'm looking, I'm, my studio is also where my trainer is, right? So I'm looking at my Cervelo sitting on there and it's, I mean, they're, gravel riding wouldn't be around if there would, if disc brakes weren't a thing, right? Like if, yeah. if, if we yeah. didn't make that move, we wouldn't be doing this. That's why the biggest tires I could ride at those old gravel races were 28s. You know, cause that was yeah. on, you know, if you had a cross bike, obviously you could ride something bigger, but it's, yeah, it's, it's cool. It's fun. It's interesting to see where, where it all goes and where we like stop and we're like, okay, I'm now riding a mountain bike again. Yeah. I'm, I'm very much there. I mean, people look at my gravel bike and I have one of those Rudy suspension forks on it. Yeah. And I tell people like, you know, where I ride, it's just, 
it's better. It's faster. It's safer. I'm more comfortable. I go straight up and down the coastal range. There's no in between. And I'm flying into things and having the suspension just means I flat less and have more fun. Totally. And so we're, we're on the same page. We're going to geek out here for a second. But so I also have, I have the competitor to yours. I have the Fox fork. I'm on the Eastern Overland, the gravel team. We've got Fox and it's, you know, before that, if somebody, somebody said, Hey, I want to bike with the fork on. I'm like, dude, if you're going to ride something where you need a suspension fork, ride your freaking mountain bike. Right. Like that was always my line. And they sent me one. They're like, try it out. And I'm like, just mind blown. Right. Like, it is so much fun. And I'm not even, I used to say I'm embarrassed to say, I'm not embarrassed to say anymore. It is my favorite bike. And I do have like an embarrassment of riches that I've got a couple of my Asparos. So I have one set up without one with, and it's just for old dudes with neck issues and like just everything that comes with being old, it is so much more comfortable, so much more fun. And I did this huge, I'm well, not that huge bikepacking trip from, boulder to steamboat with decker this summer and i had my front suspension on and bikepacking it was like game changer because like you're going down embedded rock at 20 miles an hour with all that weight on like when you see it you just like this one i'm like trying to jump stuff and going off little drops and stuff it's great yeah yeah same way so same way it'll be it'll be it'll be interesting to see where it where it goes yeah, I'm I'm super interested to see like when the kind of average cyclist starts to see that as being an advantage cuz you you would imagine like people who are really into the sport like you and I like we could suffer like we could take the abuse if we wanted with a rigid totally. fork and you know we could make that choice but we're not we would seemingly be more willing to take that abuse than the average cyclist should. Totally. And 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 this is what is it's like a I think gravel hit the accelerator when we hit COVID right on like where it was going to go. And it like, I'm, I don't know if anybody buys a road bike as their first bike anymore. Right. But a bunch of people yeah. buy gravel bikes for their first bike, which is great. I mean, dude, more people on bikes is all great things. I right? love it. But it's interesting that the, it seems like, like I see people move to bend and people that live in bend are on forums and like, Hey, I've, can I, can I ride this single track on the gravel bike or da da da? And I'm like, that you shouldn't you shouldn't be doing all this on a full rigid bike like it actually doesn't like it's not fun like i i encourage you like i i'm I'm sure you can and i'll support you in trying but you'll have way more fun if you're on a bike that actually is like suited for it and i think yeah i think those bikes and dude like i'm probably a year away from thinking e-gravel bikes are the best thing ever you know just <laughs> you know seeing people like i know people like carl's dad rides an e-bike and they go on 60 mile rides now where that couldn't yeah. happen before you know it's just cool it's, yeah. it's great to see where innovation has taken us for for sure yeah 100 percent. i didn't know i'd see alignment with you so well on these subjects <laughs> <laughs> oh it's just i mean cupid's cupid's uh, shooting his arrow over here <laughs> as you got sucked into kind of gravel racing and I, I remember a few years back you were part of the eastern overland team it sounds like you still are yeah did that become more of like where you were getting your kind of racing out of your system yeah c compared to triathlon yeah for sure and i when, when i when i stopped racing triathlon i i mean probably for the last few years i didn't like i didn't love it and I, I might not have ever been the person that like loved it but coming from my background as an overweight dude to someone who's like flying around the world making a living in a professional sport it was like pinch me right but i always was bummed when I couldn't do the stuff that I really wanted to do, you know, racing bikes and skiing and that, and that sort of thing. So when I had the opportunity, you know, East and Overland, it was probably after my first year at Unbound, I raced with Craig Ritchie and some other Michael Vandeham and some dudes there. And we're like, Hey, we should start this team. And they're like, Hey, do you want to be on this team? And I'm like, okay. And this is way back in the day. And this is funny, like looking back at it now, they're like, okay, what will it take you to be on the team? And I said, okay, two things. You can never refer to me as a professional gravel racer because at the time that didn't exist. Right. And I'm like, don't do that. And second, you can't pay me anything. <laughs> of course, now it's like <laughs> the, the opposite going in, but just a, a rad group of people. And it's all kind of a hobby for us. And, you know, the goal is trying to find people that could maybe use gravel as a platform to become athletes. Right. And, and make a living off of it. And like, we've, fell into finding Amity the first year and like three months later she won unbound and it's yeah. like all of us were like we get no credit for that because we didn't 
we, no offense, Amity, if you're listening, we didn't think you were going to win on Bound that first year, right? So we're, and she's still involved and she's, she's a sweetheart and she, yeah, she's awesome to still, still be around. But so we continue to want to try to open doors for people that might not have it. And then for old timers like us that just kind of want to still have a good time, it allows me to, to be around cool folks and ride cool equipment and still go on adventures, which is sweet. Yeah, absolutely. When you think about like the experience of a gravel event, a good gravel event, and then you compare that to like an Ironman day, do you, are there similarities, like just sort of how you feel the accomplishment, the journey you have to take throughout some of these events? For sure. For sure. And I definitely, and I think the most similar was unbound and because it just, I did it in 18 and it it gave me challenges in ways I didn't think mostly like I flatted three times and that was like, I kind of had some assumption that that would happen, but not to that extent. And like, you know, getting back to the front group till the last flat, like kept going like that was, you know, it was like all these, and then you're used to that in triathlon where it's like, it's never the person that has the clean race that wins because nobody does. Right. So it's like adapting and, and that I love. So that was really similar, but the the depth of like it's hard because i think i'm gonna get crap for this but i think every gravel race besides unbound in my experience is like way easier than an iron man and that's because you're not running man and maybe if you're a great runner you would not say the thing but i was a t- shitty runner and i was just trying to get to the finish line every time right so like coasting when you're really f- freaking tired that wasn't a thing in triathlon and it is in gravel. So like for me, the shorter ones totally like up to six hours, way easier. The unbound because you can keep going when you're tired, the like depth of how fatigued you get is like a different level. Cause Ironman I've done at like nine hours max. And if you're struggling, it's your like legs that are tweaking out or like you like stop where in, in Kansas, you're just, you have to keep going and you're like, your, your level is well below E. So it's, uh, it's cool. Like you definitely have to like figure out where, where your energy is coming from. And again, the, the similarities for me, the, the problem solving is, is fun. Yeah. I mean, the last, the last aid, the last stop at Unbound after I had, I'd finally kind of cracked after the third flat and I call into the guys and I'm like, it's all coke and gummy orange slices and they're like what do you mean i'm like everything <laughs> and they like changed and i literally ate like you know three pounds of orange slices you get at the gas station and you know 96 ounces of coke to get to the finish line like it's 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 chaos it's awesome it's super awesome yeah i you know it's interesting you know i enjoy talking to people with a triathlon background because i was a hobbyist triathlete like i'm like a i don't know uh 11 and a half hour Iron Man kind of guy. Yeah. But what I learned early on was like, you just, you can't cut corners. Like you have to think about your nutrition. You have to think about what's next. Something's always going to go wrong. And then when I started doing these gravel events, it was the same way. It was like, not like I was an exceptional athlete, but I just didn't get bothered if stuff went wrong. Like my bike was going to break. I was going to fix it. I was going to keep going. I was going to yeah. bonk, but you know, half the people ahead of me were going to go through the same thing. And it's just a matter of keeping the pedals going forward. Totally. And I think you get to the point where when something happens and you have a struggle, whether it's nutrition or mechanical, like as quickly as possible, you figure out and triage, like, is this fixable? Okay. If it's not, then like, what's my clears out? Like, how do I get what I need? And then you keep going. It's yeah, it's super fun. And that being said, like, I don't know that I've ever not finished a gravel race. And in most cases, like, again, like at Unbound that first year, not that like whatever, but a lot of people then didn't know what they do now. And people would have been like, okay, my race is over, but it's like, no, stick a plug in it, chase back on, blah, blah, blah. Like I was still in the race till, you know, 140 miles or something until I got my third one. So it's like, it's fun, not the way you'd want to do it, but it's like, there's always opportunities. And all that being said, game has changed since then. I'm not, that's not an option. I don't think at the the front group anymore over it. Yeah. 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 I think you're right. All right, I want to take Fun. a pretty hard detour and yeah. talk about protect our winters. Can you just kind of give the listener an overview? What what the heck is it? Yeah, so it's the Protect Our Winters is a nonprofit 
that was started actually by Jeremy Jones. I want to say it was like 2007 and he's a professional snowboarder now runs a company called Jones snowboards. The people, if you search for him, you'll, you'll find him pretty, pretty rad dude. Pretty, pretty cool. Like in hindsight, now looking at him, I went to DC with him and it's like, it's hilarious. It's like, you know, bro, he's snowboarder dude has like started this like full machine that's like helping us survive <laughs> the next <laughs> little bit on earth. But yeah, I think I won't assume what his story was because I, I won't tell it as well as he did, but basically just going out in the, and exploring the, the zones that he loved, but also obviously depended on to make a living. He saw that it was all changing, right? Like the winters were not, I mean, it's a very, is a very yeah i mean he 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 definitely saw he saw the issue and was like man what can i do to fix this and like, i think it was a very uh, bold at the time thought to be like i'm going to be able to make a difference but i think he and i dude, i mean i'm sure if you talk to him now there's no way he he would the protector winners would be where it's at but basically he's you know trying to to make a change and use voices of you know, obviously it started in winter sport. So winter sport athletes to, to, you know, he obviously had a platform to talk to people that were fans of snowboarding and for him specifically to be like, Hey, this is real. The, the world is changing and it's, it's not going in the right direction for us to be able to do what we want to do for fun. And then started obviously using other people in winter sports and then summer sports and so on and so on to try to, to broaden the, you know, I think it, it was not lucky, but like maybe a little bit lucky that the growth of protect our winners happened at the same time as social media kind of taking off because the kind of ambassadors and Alliance members that these guys have aligned with are able to reach a lot of people that care about where they live, but maybe don't think that they can have an impact or do anything with it. And I think that the overarching, vibe I get from protect our winners and talking to the folks is just like, man, you know what? You can be involved. You can make a difference. And if, and right now, especially like voting is, is huge. And if these Alliance members or these, you know, people like Jeremy can you know, influence their followers to no matter what your viewpoint is to go out and, and vote. And preferably if you're part of what we refer to as the outdoor state, which is anybody that, participates in outdoor sports whether you're a hunter or fisherman or whatever like you probably care about what's going to happen to our planet in the next little bit whether it's because it's what you do for spare time or you know for me living in bend you know it affects the community you know like fire is real and fire season has always always kind of been a thing but now it's like fire season is like a month and it might be yeah two weeks man where like the aqi is over 400 and you're not going outside to do anything if and like if you're inside you got an air filter and you're still not doing anything right so it's yeah. for me that was kind of the the crux was was getting out and uh, you know seeing that that there's a problem that needs to be solved but again i think protect our winners does a good job and be like there is something that you can do to to help and i mean i know you've got a similar you know, viewpoint and concern and, you know, wanting to, to impact as well. What was it like for you to try to f be like, okay, I'm this like little dot. How do I like, th I think that's the first thing, right? It's like, well, there's nothing I can do, right? Like me recycling is going to do yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, going back to Jeremy's like the origin story, like it's really natural, like as a snowboarder who goes back to the same mountain year after year to kind of understand visually, like where the snowpack level is. Yes. Yes. Where, sure. you know, what's possible to ride and that's what's not possible to ride. And I think what I started seeing in California with the droughts and the wildfires is like the reservoirs I would go by were just shockingly low. And then combine that with, as you were just saying, like having to actually know what AQI is and get a little app on my phone to look at it every single year to see yeah. the effects of smoke blowing into our community from forest fires it was just really stark. And that's yeah. what I found interesting about the Athletes Alliance is like anybody who touches the outdoors, if you're a gravel cyclist, a rock climber, you're seeing it firsthand happening in front of you. Oh, for sure. And it's it's funny that you say that because, you know, living in Bend and I grew up in Northern California and cut my teeth, raised bikes and stuff down there. And 
I'll go down for MIGS races in Grasshopper stuff and in NorCal. And I mean, one year on the way back, I had to like go a different way home because the way I was wanted to go home was on fire. And it's, you know, not the same as it used to be. And it's, uh, it's sketchy. Right. And it's, it's, it's real, but again, honestly, like, so I've got buddies that are involved with protect our winners. And that's why I kind of got involved myself is them just chatting and thinking I had uh, a platform and obviously knowing that I'm aligned politically and care about the same things. But for me, and I don't know if it's the same for you, but for me, it was like, well, what, what the heck can I do? Right? Like it, it I, I think that the last few years, people just feel like be down. Like we're not going to be able to, to change anything. Right. Like where, where are you, yeah. where's your head in that? Yeah. I think, you know, early on in my, my sort of life post-college, I used to think about politics, honestly, like every four years in the filter of who's the presidential candidate that I get behind Yeah, and is probably the last kind of maybe eight to 12 years that I just started to realize like having a say in who's representing you locally and having those preponderance of voices starts to, to make a difference. And I did some phone banking to try to get people out to vote for candidates. And I started cool. to realize there was like this huge disconnect for people. Like they just didn't even make a plan to vote. They didn't make it a priority. And I, I just started to think to myself, like it's only a few times a year you're asked to vote. It's not right. that big a deal. And spend a little time getting educated about what the candidates are there for. And if it, whatever lands for you, support them, do it. This is like our civic responsibility not to be up on a soapbox. Yeah, for sure. And it, yeah, it's not, it's not, again, it's not that hard. And depending, and I'm speaking from a, a place of privilege, right? For me, it's not that hard. For you, it's probably not that hard either. In Oregon, we have mail-in voting. So it's like incredibly easy. If someone in Oregon said it's hard, it's because they're lazy, in my opinion, or, you know, I shouldn't judge. But anyways, it, it is pretty darn easy compared to, to what it used to be. We're not standing in line for an hour at a time, right? It's it's pretty simple. And it it it's impactful, right? And I think that's the important thing. And, and there's so many resources to be able to, it's not like these days, like clearly you can go and get the pamphlet they send you and read through everything. Or you can, yeah. I mean, you could probably Google, what should I vote for having this opinion? And I'll find it conveniently. Here's a plug. Uh, Stoke the Vote campaign from PAL. You can actually just text 65351, text Stoke to that number. And they'll like tell you where their nearest polling spot is. And if you want, they'll actually give you, you know, some, a voter guide that kind of tells you who to vote for or what this is under the action fund of protect our winners, kind of a sister, sister company. And they'll, they'll tell you kind of where to vote and what line to vote on if your concern is the environment and specifically this go around, it's like Montana, Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, and I think Utah are like super, super important. So if you live in any of those States and you happen to be listening, text six, five, three, five, one, and they'll let you know. But like, I mean, me and my buddies and, you know, cycling, I think it's a very social pastime and me and my cycling buddies every year, uh, or every four years or every two years, we'll like have a dinner party and everybody brings their, like not uh, their ballots necessarily, brings their pamphlets and like talk about it. Right. And like, we're never getting in arguments or anything. We're just like saying what everything is and kind of, I don't know. I, I think it's, uh, it brings something more to our like friendship and like our casual hanging out more than just like talking about bikes. And it's, it's kind of fun to like hash it out, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I was visiting the protectourwinters.org site today and clicked on yeah. the Stoke, Stoke your vote and saw that whole process that you mentioned over text message. Like I put in my name, my address, oh, cool. click through, told me all about the California deadlines, how to return the ballot, how to track the ballot. And I, I was, I was reading cause they, it sort of had an interesting breakdown of the fundamentals. And it's like, okay, make sure you're registered to vote and Powell can kind of help facilitate you yeah. finding that information out if you're not registered to vote, make a plan to vote. So make it easy, get the stuff in front of you so you can figure out how physically you're going to vote, whether you're going to mail it in, whether you're going to walk in and, and, and submit the ballot and cast your vote. And yeah. again, how, how you should be looking at your local ballot measures from the context of, we all love this thing, gravel cycling. Whether you believe it or not, it's happening that it's, it's, 
it's being impacted and whether it's yeah. massive rainstorms in the Midwest for the early season, mid South gravel races or mammoth tough right. getting canceled because of California wildfires, the same things happening in Oregon, like all this stuff, it's right as our, at our doorstep as gravel athletes. And you cannot close your eyes. You have to get out there and vote. No, totally. Yeah. A hundred percent. You said it, said it perfectly. And I think it's hard too, cause I think at, at times with how crazy our political environment is right now that people just, you know, don't believe everything, you know, people have, have some people have doubts in the political system in general. That is like, look at the facts. We're not going to go down that, that rabbit hole, but even if it is like, try, like all you can do is try. Right. And I, I'm pretty confident that my vote's going to make a difference. But I think the big thing that you can ignore is I think sometimes, especially in, you know, where I live from, where I live and my beliefs, people just, we just assume like you look at the polls, you're like, everything's fine. It's like, no, dude, do not trust the polls. Like we, that is not something that we can rely on. And I think for so many reasons outside of what we're talking about now, even it's so important, this next election. And and I think it's hard because I think a lot of the people that are disillusioned a little bit are, are folks that are young folks. And a lot of those people aren't voting. And a lot of people that like myself are kind of live in a, a area of, of privilege to a certain extent. You think, well, whatever, everything's fine. Like I don't need to vote, but it's like, man, no, we do. And no matter what, where you live and what your socioeconomic zone is or what you do for a pastime, like something in this next election is going to affect you, right? So if you care about it or you care about, it's certainly going to affect someone you love. So get out there and get off your ass. And in my case, I don't even have to get off my ass. They just send the ballot to me and I put it in my mailbox and send it back. So there's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a great time to want to be involved. Yeah. And I think there's, there's such a thing as political will and just whether you're in a region that has climate favorable policies and that's the prevailing kind of political political wisdom, great. You still yeah. need to st- show up and show that we've got massive amounts of support for these right. kind of things because there's other parts in the country that you know don't have the same kind of support, have a lot more headwinds to addressing climate change and every little bit helps. For sure. And I think there's the, even the, the other side of it is there's, and me, you know, the first, when I first got involved with POW, I was like, man, I'm not gonna be able to make a difference. Like, you know, people have been trying to, to make a change in this for years. It's, you know, there's still people that don't believe that climate change is real and all this stuff. Right. And then I went, I was lucky enough to be able to go to Washington DC with protect our winners and, and a bunch of folks through the athlete Alliance and the, creative and science alliance and like sitting down and talking to senators and congressmen and stuff. And it's kind of crazy. I'm like, whatever, I'm here. We'll see if you guys think I can make a difference, whatever. Not that I'm, I think that I did, but in every conversation we're sitting down with very conservative representatives and not one of them did we spend any time debating whether or not it's real. And like, that's, stinking huge, man. Like that was not the case yeah. four years ago. And like, I was in a couple of meetings with Jeremy Jones and he left, he's like, dude, that is not, that is not how this used to be. So keeping like being annoying and knocking on the door and saying, Hey, this is important to me. And of course, like we're going there with the like the facts, like, Hey, the outdoor state is, you know, over 600 million people and this many dollars is going into it. So you start talking their language a little bit, be like, Hey, if, my town burns down, then they're going to lose this much money and blah, 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 whatever it is. But like to leave that and have the like conservative Congress people like high five and be like, Hey, send me an email. Let us know how we can help. is like awesome. It's really cool. Yeah. That's amazing. What an amazing experience to see government working like that. Maybe it's not working fast enough, but just to, to be there and having the conversation, like that's important. Totally. And, and, you know, and, and, and pal is definitely, you know, I feel lucky being able to have that firsthand experience, but anybody who's involved in power or supporting pow is, you know, helping all that infrastructure be around for us to go there and do that. And like, you know, before the last vote for the bill for, you know, a bunch of money going to climate change and relief and stuff, you know, I was like emailing swing 
voting representatives, right? It's like, that's crazy, man. They're emailing back. Like, it's pretty cool. So, like, you know, bragging a little bit about what POW does, like, there's a bunch of stinking smart people making the right moves. And it's hard, too, because I think, I've got a little bit of a tangent. I think, and this was my barrier to being involved with POW. And if it wasn't for my buddies, I probably wouldn't have been. Because, man, I don't know how good you are at, like, sorting your recycling. But, like, I'm not very good. Like, I'm... I'm imperfect when it comes to this stuff, right? And one of Powell's big things is it's imperfect advocacy, man. Like in the end, like I'm still trying to get better at all that, right? And like I want to eventually get an EV because it makes a lot of sense on a bunch of different levels. And, you know, I, I recycle and I try to do everything I can, take my bag, to, like everything I can. But in the end, the the personal change isn't really as big of an impact. It and I'm being polite, it's the systemic change that is going to get us out of this shit. And yeah. that's what Protect Our Winners is is shooting for. And they're like combining all of these resources of these people to go where it actually matters. And if we can get, you know, every ski resort to change to to being more efficient and, you know, you know, government to be able to, to, to function at a level where we're using renewable resources and things that we can do now. And that's one big thing with POW2 is that right now they're just like, okay, keep an eye down the road but like we're looking like right now like near horizon stuff stuff we can change now because if we can convince people in the government to put give energy into doing something like let's do the stuff that we can take care of now and so they're like kind of cleaving on that where i think there's there's a lot of other people looking down towards the road you know further down the road yeah 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 i'm so glad this conversation was able to happen now and you know, I kind of turned myself a little bit inside out thinking, oh, I got a couple of podcasts I'm supposed to put out there. Then it oh, dawned funny. on me, like, what, what what, am I doing? Like, we got one week until the midterm elections. If we can change a couple minds and get some people to make a plan to vote, if we can expose them to Powell's efforts over the long term. Like, that's what I need to be doing. And I hate to be soapboxy to the listener. As I mentioned to you offline, like, I tend to sit back and not sure. say a whole hell of a lot. But yeah. I really do believe it's important to get out there and make a plan and vote. And you've got time to do it this year. Dude, for sure. For sure. And I mean, I, I, I don't mean to diminish as I did in the past. Like, you know, I've been a slacker in the past too. I mean, when I was younger, I didn't vote because I was lazy or whatever. But, and I'm sure there were issues that were very, very important then that I ignored. But I think now it's kind of hard to to look and think that this election specifically isn't super important. And again, kind of the the... The, the moves that have been made just in the last couple months to help in climate change, you know, if everything changes in two weeks, they can cleave a bunch of that and take that stuff back, right? Like the way our, our system works. So it's like, we're all celebrating and high-fiving that we've got this thing across the line. But in the end, if we vote the wrong people in in two weeks, then that's yeah. gone. And we're back you're, at ground zero, right? Yeah, you're back at mile 150 at Unbound 200, right? Right again. Dude, that's the worst place to be. <laughs> exactly. <I've never> <laughs> that's the worst place to be. It's so close, but yet so far. That's a great analogy. I think we're going to start using that at PAL 150 at Unbound. Right on. Yeah. Perfect. That's too funny. Well, dude, yeah. No, and it, I will echo what you just said. And again, I'm, I'm similar to you. I don't assume that people want to listen to my opinion very often, but it comes to a point where like right now I don't care. So I apologize if you, you guys don't want to hear my opinion, but in the end, it I don't even care who you vote for or what you vote for. Go out and vote, right? Like yeah. that's your responsibility and we're able to do that in this country. And I don't think we should take that for granted. Clearly I'd, I'd like you to support, you know, voters or people that are coming in to to help with climate change because it's affecting what we're doing, gravel racing, what we're doing in winter sports and, you know, us surviving the next, uh, the next century. So if you've got the capability, get out, get out and vote. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better myself, Matt. Cool. Well, great to get to know you a little bit. I can't wait to yeah. run into you at some of these gravel events down the line. For sure. And I appreciate all your time. Yeah. Thanks. The, thanks for having me on and bringing a little attention to POW and yeah, we'll, We'll get some we'll get some gravel riding in a bend or Norco. I'll be down there soon enough. Right on. That's gonna do it for this week's edition of the Gravel Ride Podcast. Normally I would be taking a moment to ask for your support with a rating or review. But this week I just want you to get out there and vote. Make sure you're organized. Make sure you've got your ballot. If you're not registered already, figure out if it's possible to register at this moment in your state. 
but get out there and do it. No excuses this year. Until next time, here's to finding some dirt under your wheels. 